Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this uh, session on eBrands Atlases. My name is Timo Dickscheid, and I will be giving this session together with Rick Willergaard and Maya Kuchardis, who is here, who are both here on the call from Oslo. I'm uh, situated in Germany and working at the Forschungszentrum in Jülich myself. And we have also Hiba here, Hiba Asim, uh, who is a community manager for our services and will also uh, track the session uh, a little bit in the background and watch for your questions and so on. Um, the, the way we will organize this session is as follows. I, I will give a very uh, quick introduction uh, now, and then uh, we will introduce you uh, conceptually to the atlases in a first rather short part, uh, in particular on the human atlas and the waxon space red atlas. This part will be given by Trickle. Um, and then the larger part of, of our two hours this morning uh, will be the tutorials where we really go into concrete tools and uh, uh, and concrete applications in the tools and services here so that you can really see things working in practice. There will also be uh, several parts where you can get your hands on things yourself. We will post some links uh, where you can uh, where you can try out things yourself while I'm doing it on the screen uh, in, in the last parts here. Maya will finish uh, this session with a, uh, introducing you to a concrete workflow that brings together a lot of different things. And then we hope we have a few minutes left at the end for, for additional questions. Um, from, for the tutorials, I think uh, we will be happy to take your questions while we are showing things, if, especially if something is not working. Otherwise, we have planned for a few minutes behind each of the dots you see here uh, um, to, to answer your questions after each of the parts. So uh, when, whenever you have uh, trouble understanding something or trouble trying something out, uh, feel free to, uh, to just step in. We are not such a large audience. You can just raise your hand and talk or also pose a question in the chat. Um, and if it can wait, uh, we will usually uh, watch for questions after each of these, of these parts here. All right, um, then let, let me just start with a little introduction. We are talking here about brain atlases, and of course, it's important that we have a, a common understanding what a brain atlas is. Um, here in eBrains, uh, we usually say that a brain atlas uh, consists of a certain reference space in, a, in the most basic form. So a certain coordinate system, just like we have a, a coordinate system on the uh, globe for atlases of the Earth. And then we usually have a map uh, that delineates certain regions in this reference space, which is very often given as a, as a labeled image, as you can see here on the bottom, or labeled surface is what we see here. That is very similar to maps of the Earth, of course, and it's defined in this space. And then a third major or important part is that there is a taxonomy that is giving names to these brain regions. And usually the taxonomy also describes certain relationships like very often uh, it is a hierarchy of brain regions and it describes how, how some of them form larger parts and how, how, they, are, how they are related to each other. Uh, these are the very basic things that we always expect for an atlas. Uh, but of course, the situation is more complex. So for example, uh, we typically have different ways of mapping uh, a brain and this can follow different modalities, just like for the earth, we could have an atlas uh, of the political situation or of the topography or of the climate, as you see it here. And that is very similar for the eBrains atlases. There are different maps, different reference spaces, different species that we can, uh, that we can access. In particular, the, the key parts of, of eBrains atlases are atlas of the human brain, atlas of the red brain, and of the mouse brain, as you see here. There's actually also a monkey brain atlas in development, the basic one, which is not yet released. We started this work very late, but uh, if you're interested in monkey atlas, uh, watch out for news. I'm, I'm expecting a first release, of a first result towards the end of the year. Um, before we go into more detail about the concepts and the tools, I'd like to give you a, a, a rather general overview how these atlases are integrated into eBrains, uh, which you probably learned a lot about already, uh, which is the research infrastructure being built by the Human Brain Project 
uh, that provides uh, uh, very different levels of um, uh, services and infrastructure. And um, the eBrands atlases make heavy use of this infrastructure. And it all starts with the eBrands curation services. So we have teams, I, I think you've probably seen this already during uh, this uh, uh, event here. Uh, we have uh, curation teams who help um, curating metadata for data sets and integrating them into eBrands and making them findable uh, and accessible through our systems. And for the atlases, we use these curation services as well because our atlases are composed out of curated data sets and uh, curated metadata and, and ontologies. And this is done in close cooperation with the eBrands curation services. So they bring the data sets and the concepts and the vocabularies into the eBrands knowledge graph which is the metadata database that eBrands is hosting, which is a quite complex one. It's a graph database, uh, which is mostly visible through a search, uh, a visual search interface on the, uh, on the eBrands knowledge graph, where you can search for data sets and models and so on. So that's also where the most of the uh, ingredients of our atlases go as well. And then we provide atlas services that allow uh, to work with these atlases. And these atlas services fetch their, uh, their content typically from the knowledge graph, not without exceptions, uh, but, but mostly. And we are, of course, today talking uh, um, particular about these eBrands Atlas services. You will sometimes see these links uh, to, the, to the knowledge graph in our presentations. But please remember that this is running on the infrastructure and using these other levels as well. And what you also do not really see when you work with these Atlas, but what is very important is uh, that we also use the high performance compute infrastructure Phoenix uh, that is uh, that is working together with, with eBrands and providing really the, the hardware and the compute and the storage for all of this um, in the background. So this is of course also linked by the eBrands Atlas services and uh, very often you, you don't realize it uh, when using them. So that's how it looks like. And the main entry point for the Atlas is, of course, the ePrints portal. It's ePrints.eu, uh, where you find access to the different services as they are released. As you know, we are still in the project, in the human brain project that is building ePrints. We still have a few years to go. So not everything is yet there. Not everything is yet at its full uh, uh, release stage. But the things that are already released, you can find them here over the portal. And if you click on services, you find there a section on atlases and it briefly gives you access to three different categories. There's software for accessing the atlases. There are tools for integrating data with brain atlases. And there are tools and workflows that, for analyzing data uh, using brain atlases. These are the three broad categories and we will see examples from each of this uh, to, during our session here today. Um, so um, this, uh, yeah, we pay particular attention that atlases are an important part for doing reproducible science, reproducible neuroscience, and this has uh, three uh, three aspects that I would like to highlight here. The first is that, as I already uh, pointed out, our atlases are designed as fair data sets, so they are not uh, separate from this. Everything you find in an atlas is a, is a uh, a data set that is curated uh, uh, following the FAIR principles of open science. And um, the second, uh, and you will see this uh, in, in my presentation very soon, that when you select an atlas, you find the metadata, you find the links to the knowledge graph uh, for these parcellations and, and, and whatever we have in there. The second aspect is um, that the interfaces are designed uh, uh, to support reproducible workflows with atlases. So if you build workflows that use our atlases, um, there are Python and HTTP interfaces that make it rather easy uh, to build these workflows in a reproducible way uh, and not uh, uh, doing a cut by downloading stuff and forgetting where you, where you received it from and starting your experiment only from there. And the third aspect, so this, so this, this we, will, we will see such tools and we will see such programmatic access in particular very soon uh, um, this morning or this afternoon. Uh, 
The third aspect is um, that we, uh, we are convinced that atlases help making neuroscience data better findable and interpretable. Uh, because we use atlases to add location metadata to other data sets, uh, integrate them with atlases, so they, they also have spatial metadata, location metadata, and uh, we very often uh, find then that data sets provide multimodal features of brain regions, so they actually enrich the atlases by being linked to certain brain regions, since they describe these brain regions uh, in more detail and, uh, and in, uh, according to different principles. And we will get to these three aspects uh, during this morning. So for the last one, just a, a quick example. Um, if you see a volume of interest from, from a, a lab with a certain imaging modality like this one here, if you're a, a good neuroscientist, you might have an idea what that is. But of course, if you, if you just have this image, it's, it's not so easy to make use out of it and to interpret and understand it very well. Uh, but if we integrate it, as you see here on the right, uh, into a whole brain context, put it at a certain location, you, then you can very easily discover, oh, this comes from the human brain, it's a part of the hippocampus, and it's, ah, it comes from this hemisphere, not from the other, yeah, you see the location, you can appreciate the, uh, um, how close it is to other brain regions, and so on and so on. So we, we really believe that atlases are a very important tool to make uh, data sets in neuroscience better usable, better findable, and so on. And you will, uh, we, these two tools that we show here are examples uh, of tools for integrating data with atlases. The one on the left, Quickney, which can be used uh, to integrate uh, histological sections into 3D brain atlas context, uh, will be shown by Maya in the last part of this session. The one on the right, Ruluba, is not presented in detail today, but you can find information about it on the website. All right, um, then I'm hoping I'm so far in time. We will now get a little bit more to the Atlas concept, but we have a few minutes if you have questions at this point. I didn't watch the chat, so are there any questions so far? Okay, then let's move on and use the time. Um, I will talk a bit about the multi-level Atlas in, in particular now, how it is constructed before I give the stage to, to, to talk about the red brain atlas. So the human brain atlas, um, it, it has three key features. Uh, the first of which is it captures the organization of the human brain both at the microscopic level, so at microscopic detail, as you can see here by an uh, illustrative map on the bottom, but also captures variability across different human brains. And then it provides access to brain region features. I already described that, that we believe that data sets can enrich the descriptions of the brain in an atlas. And we have many data sets, and this, uh, this amount is constantly increasing, linked to brain regions that describe these regions in different ways. For example, uh, histological information, uh, distributions of nerve fibers or cells, uh, functional information, and so on. And the third aspect is that, that we have uh, connectivity information linked to the atlas that describes, of course, how different brain regions are connected. And all of this becomes use, uh, can be used through the framework of this multi-level brain atlas. Illustrating it a bit more, um, we start composing the atlas at this level uh, from histology where you see individual cells. This, we have here the one micron scale. And then we go up a bit uh, to the scale of around, you see here, a scale around 20 micron, where we can actually delineate different brain regions uh, based on the way that, that cells uh, um, compose into, into layers and areas and according to the densities of different types of cells. So you see here the transition between uh, the, the primary and secondary visual cortex in a histological section. And we can map these, uh, these transitions between these sections that's what we are doing at this scale. And we bring such uh, maps, such uh, delineation principles into 3D using the big brain model. This is a microscopic whole brain model of the human brain composed uh, from a full stack of over 7,000 tissue sections. Um, and it has been reconstructed in a, it was quite, uh, quite a huge project and a huge work, um, which uh, finished in 2013. 
where we put from, from the whole stack of histological images put together together with our friends in Canada in, at McGill, uh, this, uh, this 3D brain model. And this is a part of the eBrain Human Brain Atlas that gives us a, a, a representation of the reference space at a microscopic scale. For this space, we have already maps of cortical layers have been developed uh, by Konrad Wachstuhl, who is now in, in, in London together with, uh, with us and with the lab of Alan Evans. Uh, so the a whole brain map of the individual cortical layers of the big brain is available. And we are currently mapping the cytoarchitectonic regions in the big brain in full 3D, according to the principles I have outlined a few slides earlier, according to the cytoarchitecture. And you find the first full 3D maps at full resolution in the big brain now, uh, which have been um, uh, have been produced with the help of deep learning, supporting new scientists. Um, if you if you look at this map of area one, for example, this has been mapped in in about two thousand histological sections. So this would not be possible uh, to do manually uh, with a, with a uh, common method. It has been done with the support of of uh, machine learning under supervision uh, of neuroscientists in Ulich. And we are working on more and more of these areas to be fully mapped in, in the big brain model. Now, the big brain model is just one brain, and the human brain differs significantly. You see here areas V1 and V2 mapped in 10 different postmodern brains, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, imaged in 3D at, at a much reduced resolution. So these, these areas here have not been mapped in every histological section, but in a subset only. And then we have built 3D maps at the millimeter scale to show the topography of these brains. And you see how much this differs in the human brain. So we cannot just use one map in one brain as a good example for mapping the human brain. And that is why we integrate the Jülich brain for realistic cytoarchitectonic atlas, where the, uh, the group of Katrin Amunds has worked over many years now to delineate uh, many areas in 10 different postmodern brains, as described, and project these delineations then to a 3D reference space, to the uh, um, um, MNI reference space. So we can project uh, the delineations from 10 different brains, I'm only showing three here, into the reference space, and then merge them to get a probabilistic map at the millimeter scale uh, that captures uh, this, this variation across the different uh, individuals and shows us where, at which location in the reference space, it is very likely to see these brain regions and in which positions it's rather unlikely or even uh, completely uh, unlikely that we see this particular brain region. And we link this Jülich brain atlas with the probabilistic maps with the big brain that captures the microscopic detail uh, uh, in different ways. One way is that we have, of course, spatial transformations uh, that can give us uh, uh, the approximate corresponding locations, 3D locations in these two different spaces. But of course, since we use the same principles uh, for the cytoarchitectonic delineations uh, um, for mapping these areas, we can also directly relate the, the brain region maps across these spaces, since they follow the exact same principles. So we have the full detail at the microscopic scale in the big brain model, and we, we capture the probabilistic situation, the variability in the MNI space. And what we have just now added, actually the release will come out tomorrow or so, but we can have a look at it already today, is also that we project these maps to the surface space, to the free surface surface, so that you also uh, have the same, uh, the same parcellation available on the brain surface, which, which is a very common space for many uh, neuroimaging researchers. Um, and at the MNI space here, of course, we, we do not just have the cytoarchitectonic maps. We consider this as a fundamental principle where we build on. Uh, but the eBrains Atlas, of course, supports different uh, principles of brain organization, which can be in, selected in a fewer. We will do this in a minute. Um, so for example, we support uh, maps of uh, long and short fiber bundles, which are also probabilistic. Uh, but they come from in vivo imaging, so they cover many more individuals, not only uh, um, 10 or so, but, but hundreds of individuals. And we support functional uh, segregation from Bertrand Thirion, uh, which is the Difumo Atlas um, coming from fMRI studies also across many individuals. And for all of those, we, we have continuous maps 
that, that reflect, the, while, we, while I'm showing here labeled maps, there are also for each region continuous maps uh, that reflect how it varies across the different individuals. Um, the third aspect, or another aspect of the atlas now is, as I already pointed out, uh, that for each brain region, we are now working hard to link uh, data from different modalities to these regions. So data coming from different experiments, different studies, different labs also, but that have been performed in these, in these same brain regions that we directly link to the atlas so that you can find, for example, distributions of cells, distributions of neurotransmitter receptors, connectivity linked to this, um, these atlases. And I will show you later on how you can access this in practice. Yeah, that was a quick run through the, uh, through the concept of the multi-level human atlas. Um, and uh, I will now give the stage to, to Trip Leagard to e explain a bit about the Waxholm atlas, uh, uh, which, which of course uh, follows a bit of, an, of a different strategy for the red brain. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Trip Leagard of the Neural Systems Laboratory at the University of Oslo. And uh, I will today tell you something about the development of the Voxholm Space Rat Brain Atlas. This is, as Tima has said, an open access three-dimensional resource, which is used in eBrains to integrate, find, and analyze data. Uh, the Voxholm Space Atlas has been developed in our laboratory for over the last decade. And in this presentation, I will try to give you a very brief insight into how it has developed. And I will try to give you a preview of the upcoming version four. Okay, but um, let me see here. But first, let's take a look at brain atlases as, as, as a resource and, and, and why we need open access three-dimensional atlases. Brain atlases are they rank among the most cited neuroscience publications and they are widely used and, and because you find uh, such atlases in all laboratories. They are used uh, for analyzing, for interpreting data. And if you look around, there are numerous atlases available for different species, strange, strange features. And, 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 and they all represent different types of resources. And of course, most atlases used are still books as you see represented in this image, but there is a strong movement now towards having three-dimensional atlases. And why is this? So if you first think about what drives the choice of an atlas that you want to use for a given purpose, well, it all depends on the purpose. So traditionally, uh, atlases were used to plan experiments and to interpret experiments. And for planning experiments, in particular to do interventions in the brain, uh, the use of a stereotactic coordinate system, like you see here, using the skull landmarks to drill a hole, for example, at a given position, then it was important to have a coordinate system navigating uh, different structures of the brain in this stereotactic space so that you could figure out where to drill your hole, where to insert your electrode or to inject something or to do any other perturbation. And for this purpose, stereotactic atlases were developed. Another motivation to use atlases is of course, to just explore the brain or to learn about brain anatomy. And for this purpose, uh, I would say that you can use almost any atlas you like because you know, or the more atlases you take a look at, the better it is because they all reflect different aspects of brain anatomy. So there it's, it, it, it's quite open. But for analytic purposes, for interpreting a given image or to define an anatomical location in your experimental material or to define a region of interest in a three-dimensional volume as Tima has talked about or in serial images as Maya will talk about, or for example, to, to like this uh, example here, to identify what, for example, would be the position of the tip from which I recorded uh, with my electrode, then, you would encounter some difficulties looking at two-dimensional plates that you will have in most book atlases. For example, because the cutting plane, if you look at this image here, you see that there is a substantial asymmetry in the shape of the hippocampus, indicating that the 
cutting plane used to generate this particular image is not coronal, but it is oblique. And then it is more, much more difficult to find the same position in this particular 2D atlas. So the use of a three-dimensional atlas uh, mitigates this because then you can find the right angle and you can find the right position and then you can map the image to the atlas and you can extract coordinates. So the ideal brain atlas, which was the question we, we, we took when we started the development of the voxel space rat brain atlas was what is an ideal atlas? It needs to be volumetric was our answer. It needs to have accurate anatomical delineations. It needs to cover the whole brain. And it needs to be open access so that people can use it, integrate it in tools and uh, continue working with it. So at the time, um, the Voxom space concept was uh, presented. Voxom is a space in uh, or a place in, in, in Sweden, uh, a little bit north of Stockholm. And at this particular place, the Digital Atlasing Task Force of the National Numismatics Coordinating Facility, INCF, met in 2009 and proposed to create or define a new coordinate-based reference space based on internal landmarks rather than skull landmarks, because in most cases when you work with uh, experimental material from mouse or rat brains, you remove the skull and then you need some recognizable features within the brain. So they suggested the Voxholm space as a common reference space for increasing interoperability between different resources used for mapping mouse brain data, but also rat brain data. So in 2010, a mouse brain uh, Voxholm space atlas was presented by Johnson et al. And in 2012, I believe, we started working on the rat brain atlas. And um, there, we implemented, uh, we, we used a, a high resolution MRI volume, and we defined the Voxom space using internal coordinates so that the coordinate system is based on a position in the brain. And by identifying also skull landmarks, it is possible to translate this to stereotaxic coordinate system so that you can navigate this brain volume. All right. The Voxon Space Atlas was, as I mentioned, defined in a high resolution uh, structural and diffusion tensor imaging MRI volume with 39 isotrop uh, micrometer isotropic voxels. In the first iteration, version one, we delineated 76 major brain regions. We presented it with criteria defining how they were delineated and we shared it through the NITRIC uh, resource. And, and this uh, is now also part of the eBrains Atlasing service. So this was version number one of the Atlas presented in 2014. Secondly, we expanded the Atlas with additional subdivisions that were defined for the hippocampal region and also the parahippocampal region, where, which is a very complex region to navigate. And there we collaborated with the domain expert, Menno Witter, who really helped us translate histological uh, criteria that you see in, in different uh, types of histological stains and translated this to the MRI volume so that we were able to identify and map the same subdivisions that you can see in histology in the high resolution MRI volume. So this was released as version two of the Voxon Space Rat Brain Atlas. Then following the same concept, we also created a third version where we uh, added 40 new subdivisions that primarily were related to the ascending auditory system. So here we used another domain expert, Kishin Olsen at the University of Oslo, and we expanded the Atlas with uh, 40 new structures so that it now uh, with the current uh, release contains 118 anatomical structures. The method used to define these structures was primarily to interpret the structural MRI image where contrast was interpreted, boundaries were identified, we compared it with histology, we looked at literature, and as, as you see here we can see certain shades that were interpreted as for example branches of a nerve or here a rainbow DTI signal was interpreted to reflect a spiraling nerve. 
And, and in this way, we were able to identify all these detailed uh, boundaries. But of course, there are limitations to the atlas. And if you look at version three of the atlas, you will see here that there are several regions that lack subdivisions. And if you compare it to the, the, the cartography and the history of, of geography, you can see that if you look at old maps, the uncharted areas were usually filled up. For example, here, this is an old map of the Mediterranean region. And in Africa, which was largely un uncharted at the time, you see a lot of compass roses and figures and symbols and uh, monsters in, at sea and these kind of things that the map makers used to fill up the empty holes. In the Voxon Space Atlas, you see this as the large green areas, and they primarily concern the cerebral cortex, the, the thalamus, which, which is the dark green region here, and also some basal ganglia regions, they're lacking structural detail. And this was, of course, also something that is needed by many experimentalists. In particular, we have received for the eBrain's uh, support service, many requests for from people being interested in mapping the cerebral cortex in the rats and needing more detailed delineations. So based on this, we have worked for quite some time now to expand the atlas. Uh, this is of course a challenging part because the uncharted areas were uncharted because there you have very little contrast in the MRI volume. So we needed to do to use different approaches to, um, to, to, uh, to map all these regions. So we are in the process of finishing this work. So you see here, we have more than 33 cortical regions ready for the cerebral cortex, more than 50 thalamic subregions, and several more details of the basal ganglia structures. So this new version of the Atlas is ready to be released in the fall, and it will be integrated in eBrains, and uh, it will be employed in the different tools that we have here that Maya Pichlavis also will exemplify at the end of this session. What we also discovered is that having several versions of an Atlas, we need to have a version management. And uh, to do this, we also developed a Atlas ontology model, decomposing an Atlas into four key elements, which are the reference images that we use, the coordinate system that you use, the delineations, the anatomical annotations, and the taxonomy or the nomenclature, as Tim also mentioned earlier, stating the brain regions, names, abbreviations, and the hierarchical organization of these names. And this reference Atlas ontology model can be used also to uh, facilitate uh, correct and specific reference to different versions, but also to see how data from different Atlas versions can be combined and integrated. So here, this is a complex plate, I will not comment much of it, but here you see that for each of these elements, there are possible vari variations and there are several important metadata that we have uh, identified. This is work that is in, uh, in preparation now. Um, but the main thing of it is that when we shortly will have an updated version of the Rat Brain Atlas version four, we will also have the Atlas ontology model, which facilitate this versioning. And this can be used to see how the different delineations. So here you see that the delineations made with version one and the associated terminology maps onto the same spatial reference, the same reference data. Same goes for version two and version three and the upcoming version four, telling you that delineations are changing. So when you use delineations for, or names from one of these versions, you need to be very specific in referring to which version are you using the name or the delineation for in your analysis. But if you, for example, use the uh, image uh, registration tool to take histological sections or volumes and map them to this uh, reference template, then you can use whichever version of the delineations you like. So for those of you, for example, being interested in the cerebral cortex, waiting for this new release, you can already start registering your images to the data volume using, for example, version three, and those registrations will be fully interoperable with the upcoming new version. So this will, we expect it to be released early fall. I will not give you any specific date for it, but we will uh, 
release this through eBrains as soon as we can. Thank you. So we will uh, we will go into um, the tutorials now, and we are pretty pretty well on the time management still. Um, so for the tutorials, um, the first two parts uh, will be given by myself before we uh, uh, go for the last part, which will be given by Maya. In my parts, we will now really uh, um, do things in a web browser, um, and you can do that on your end as well. So we will post links, a few links where you can uh, launch the tools that I'm showing on screen and you can, I will try to do things slowly and uh, uh, wait for you to ask questions and so on if needed. So we, we, we really try out things uh, uh, together. For both parts, we will see some Python coding here in the second part, and this will also work in the browser. You will have, receive a link where we can, we can work with the Python code in your browser, but we start with interactive exploration of the brain atlases. Um, so um, however you, you like, you can just follow what I'm doing on screen, but you will find links in the chat to, to do things in parallel for yourself. Uh, just, just choose the way that works best for you and, uh, and just uh, step in with questions uh, wherever needed. <clears throat> so we will, first thing to do now, we will have a look at the interactive viewer. And we will not use the version that is currently released because we have only a few days before the next release. And we will provide you a link to the release candidate, which, which includes the new version of the Ulich Brain Atlas and several new features. Um, so um, I think, Hiba, can you put this into the chat? Or did you do that already? Um, I am see it here. Um, so we will have a look at, at the recent version. I have to remove this here. And I will, I will just explain a few concepts. And if you like, you can uh, try them yourself in the browser. You would need a recent version of Firefox or Chrome. So if you have a different browser or an old browser, you might see an error message. But with a recent version of Firefox or Chrome, it should work. Um, and you should actually, when you launch it, um, you basically see a selection of the different atlases. And uh, I will show things for the human atlas at the moment. So just select the human atlas, and you should come up with a picture it's very similar to what I have on screen. And once you, you are here in the interactive viewer, uh, uh, the software, underlying software is called Zebra Explorer. Um, you can always here select uh, between the different species and also see the Waxhorn Space Atlas as well, uh, or the Mouse Atlas. Um, you should be reminded that currently this, uh, for the viewer, we concentrate still uh, much on the human atlas, so things might work a bit better for the human, but we are catching up with this. And of course, uh, the mouse and rat is also supported already. Um, so uh, when you get to the viewer, you might have seen an invitation to take a tour. I'm not sure because usually the first time uh, you run the viewer, it will, it will ask you to take a tour. Um, and you can always access this tour also here with the help button. So uh, it, it just takes you to the to the basic steps. Uh, but of course, I will I will I will do that now for you, so you can skip the tour if you like. So we start by seeing a brain. This is the uh, this is the MNI 152 standard space, um, and you can click on the brain and by moving the mouse, move it around in any of the three of the three views. On the button, you see a 3D view, which by default removes the front octant. Um, it looks a bit nicer with the new version of the Unish brain if we go to the Collins space, which is a single subject average. So here on the left, on the bottom left, there is a layer dialog, which allows you to change different things. And you can here select a different template space. And I'm going to select the Collins space, which is a single subject, a subject space. And in particular for this space, uh, we have uh, a better a better surface representation of the maps. You can see that loading here that we have here the individual maps, uh, and the, and this was not uh, the case. It's not the case yet for the for the MNI 152 space. It's just a visual thing. Uh, here on the bottom right, there is a there is an icon uh, with some settings, and for this particular one here, it it looks a bit better if we don't look at the uh, with this uh, with this front option removed, so we see the whole frame. Like this, you can always select only one of the views if you if you use this little maximization icon here. So, for example, I can only look at the coronal plane uh, by this, 
And if I hit space, then it cycles to different views. So I, I can also have a, a pure a view of the, of the surface, it's pure CD view here. And I can go back in the bottom right again to the view with four of them. Um, now, when I select a brain region, it's uh, when I click a brain region, it will select it. I'm, I'm using here area V1, clicking it, it selects it. And what happens now is uh, since for this region, we are, we are now looking at the, at the Jülich brain probabilistic atlas, and now there's one region selected, it will fetch the probabilistic map to show me actually this, uh, uh, this uh, variance that I have explained earlier uh, of this brain. And then there pops up a side panel. I will, I will maximize the view here uh, now. And we see a side panel. And here in the side panel, you, you see there's a lot of information, but let's, uh, let's go slowly. Uh, on the top already, uh, there is a button, uh, navigate to the region. This, this would actually move my, me to the center, right? And there is a little uh, icon which, which says, explore this data set in a knowledge graph. And that is quite interesting because it shows you that there's really a data set linked between all the entities. In this particular case, the probabilistic map of this single area V1 has a curated data set, if I click on this, in the knowledge graph. Yeah? So you see here right away that this is in the ePoints knowledge graph, a data set. You see here the publication associated, the, uh, the paper associated with this area. You find a link back to the viewer. We are not using that now. You can download the map here. Uh, you see the publications and so on and so on. You even see which subjects have been mapped uh, to provide, uh, to compute this map. And, 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 and when I click such a subject, this is also a concept in a knowledge graph. And I can see uh, other maps in which uh, this subject has also been involved. So there's rich information behind it. Uh, that's not the main point of the presentation today. I would just try to, uh, to mention this here. Um, we see the description from the knowledge graph also here in the viewer on the first page. And there are links to the different uh, to different templates. I'm going over this now. What's interesting here is that we find regional features. Um, there are some uh, some things in, in in this release candidate. There are not all the features shown here. Uh, we are still fixing a few bugs. But you see here the first one already shows us a data set of, of receptor neurotransmitter receptor densities that had been measured in area V1. And when I click this, this is again. A data set in the knowledge graph. I have the same icon here. I can go to the knowledge graph and find this data set here. But I go back, I find the description. And if I scroll down, I see here actually a fingerprint uh, uh, which shows me the average and uh, uh, density and the standard deviation of different neurotransmitters in that brain region. And when I click one of them, I see a cortical profile of this particular uh, of this particular neurotransmitter. This is now NMDA in area we one yeah and this is of course uh, um, we, because we, we have this is a, a highlighted feature modality a highlighted data set modality where we have performed a deeper integration with the atlas viewer so that you can do this uh, this exploration of the data here this doesn't work for all data sets linked to brain region uh, but uh, but we are uh, uh, increasing the set of, of, of modalities for which we have such an interactive support in the atlas yeah. Of course, you can download the data set here, uh, uh, and you can also follow the link to the knowledge graph to find uh, download links for the data set and, and more information about it. You see here, no. there are also... There's a question in the chat. Maybe you can just talk about that before yeah. you... That's good. Uh, how can we set specific coordinates? Yes. Um, well, let me just deselect again. Um, so you see here on the top, uh, there is, uh, you see here the, coordinate, the current coordinate in the physical space uh, where, where we have located the brain. And if I uh, use the little button here, uh, you can see I can switch between the voxel and physical space. I can copy this location and I can, of course, also write in a different location. So for example, I can simply go to the, to the zero point or whatever here in this uh, in, uh, type in physical locations. I hope, hope that this answers your question. I will actually come to this in the, in the next part of my presentation as well. Um, just checking the time, we have time. Okay, so um, back to the selected region. I'm, I'm going back to, to V1 here. Um, so there are more features linked 
here. And uh, actually, uh, there are a few features also missing. So we're still working on this. This is a release candidate here. Uh, you find also links to the maps again here uh, and, and, and other stuff. And this set of features that we link to each brain region is, is always increasing. So for example, if I let me just select the next one here, area HEC2. Um, we might find here, here diff, uh, a different selection. And for some of the areas, there's even uh, and on the left side here, you see, for example, intercranial recordings. Yeah, there are, the technology group has access to some intercranial recordings in human and epilepsy patients. And uh, we see here some electrodes uh, from, from this data set uh, that, that are touching this, this brain region here. Uh, and uh, here, here you also see a problem that we still have, that we are working on hard, uh, that some, especially for the human brain, some data is, is sensitive. And we have very strong regulations in, in Europe uh, about the data safety and so on. We might be aware of that. So uh, as of now, we cannot show here in the viewer uh, the detailed information of this data set because uh, this, is, uh, this is sensitive. And we only show the, uh, the, the anonymized data, uh, which are the locations of these electrodes in the standard space, which give you no idea of the particular subject. But you find here a link, a link to this data set. And, uh, uh, and you can here request access to the data set, but this requires you to, uh, to, re to register with your account and, and acknowledge um, a few policies. And I'm not going into detail on this. Um, soon, you will be able to go through this process right in the viewer. That's not yet possible. Yeah, you see here this, this little warning sign, but uh, in a, in a follow-up release, you will be able to do this, uh, um, uh, to request this, this access for the pseudonymous data here in the viewer as well. That's currently not possible. So you just find here that there is a data set uh, and, and, and you need to take extra steps to, to see the, the recordings. Um, so. Um, if I close this regional features pane, there's also, there's also here an, uh, a part in the side panel about connectivity. And when, when I select it, it, it will actually load connectivity matrix that is, defined, uh, that is defined for this parcellation. And it will color the brain regions according to the connection strength to the currently selected region. Um, so let me just do this one open here again and then just maximize uh, this view, it looks a bit nicer for us. So we see we have currently selected area HEC2, so uh, the secondary visual system. And you see here in the colors uh, the connection strength to other areas. And for this, it's, it's actually quite interesting uh, uh, to, to look at this uh, in the surface space. I've just told you that we are now supporting also the free surface surface. Um, so I can do the same things. I can switch here with the layer dialog on the bottom. That's what I just did to the free server space. And we actually have a slightly different viewer now activated, but I can do the same thing. I can select uh, area HEC2 again here by clicking. So it's, 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 it's the same side panel pops up again. And I think this is a bit, uh, this is, this is a bit nicer even to, uh, to see these connection strengths. For the free server space here on the bottom right, you have a new functionality here. You can also switch between the white matter surface, the peel surface, and the inflated surface, uh, like this. And you could, could even switch off, um, switch off one of the hemispheres to, to see the, uh, you see here the, the, the inner parts. Um, and then in this, uh, in this connectivity uh, browser, here you, you then see the, the connection strength to all the different areas. Uh, with links. So I can click here on one of them, let's say here, HEC3. Uh, and I can, of course, uh, go, to, well, the, uh, this doesn't yet work for the surface, I'm sorry. So if I would be in the volume, uh, this button would, would take me to this, to this brain area, but I can also here then select this other brain area. And this way I can go through the, through the connections, through the strong connections, uh, kind of navigate along the, along the, um, connection paths in the brain. Um, this connectivity data sets, uh, in principle, uh, it gives us here access to multiple connectivity matrices. Since we have here the very new version of the Julich Brain Atlas, we don't yet have many, uh, uh, many connectivity matrices 
For older versions of the Atlas, you find here already a selection of five or six different matrices. Uh, this will become very soon now also with the release for the new version so that you have here different things, not only streamline counts as we see it here, uh, but also uh, um, but also connection uh, lengths and, and uh, functional connectivity and uh, functional connectivity matrices from resting state and so on. Um, and you can download these data sets here. And again, uh, these data sets are uh, um, come from the accurate data sets and you typically find here a link to the knowledge graph for these connectivity data sets as well. Um, what time again? Okay, um, very quickly, um, now I, I deselect the area and I'm just going back to the to the volumetric space here again. Um, we told you that we have also here the link to the uh, uh, to the microscopic scale, and I will show you quickly how how this how this appears in the viewer. So if I select, for example, the uh, um, let's let's say. Um, Yeah, the primary visual cortex again. I can switch to the big brain. Yeah, yeah. I, I can also do this in the in the layer browser, as you've seen here, but it's also accessible here. And the system will uh, try to shoot at least. Let me go back. It does it best to try to preserve the the current uh, view. Maybe, maybe this is, uh, since we are working in an experimental version, it might not be working here, but um, do it from here. So if I switch here to the big brain, it should usually, now I'm, now I'm looking at the, at the visual system. And if I switch here to the big brain, it should preserve roughly the view. So you see here, it's also, it's, it has also in the big brain now selected area V1 uh, and shows, shows me the, approximately the same location in the brain. And now I have, uh, I'm viewing the big brain model, the microscopic model. So I'm able here uh, to see zoom in much more since now we have here a data set with a uh, at the full resolution 20 micron. Um, this is, it depends a lot on your network connection, how, how fast this is. It's usually uh, uh, quite doable. So if you use your, if you scroll wheel to zoom in, it will load uh, uh, the data at, at higher resolutions. Uh, I'm typically, it is not very fast while doing a Zoom call in parallel, but you see here how it works on, on my side. I just zoomed in and you see that we can go down to the level where we can see larger cells. Yeah, 20 micron, the resolution of the big model does not allow to see each individual cell, but the resolution allows us to see larger cells. And if I'm, uh, I just maximize here uh, the coronal view, uh, you, can, you can see there's really a lot of detail that you can see here. And here uh, uh, comes an aspect of the viewer uh, that is quite handy for this high resolution, which is that it is it can on the fly uh, uh, produce oblique uh, views, oblique sections of the brain. So I'm now looking at the exact coronal view. Um, but what you can do is if if you if you select the, um, the shift button on on your on your uh, um, keyboard, you just press shift and then you click on the in the brain and move the mouse. It rotates the current view, and it uh, it selects oblique sections, yeah, as you see here. So I can really rotate rotate a brain in three D quite quite quickly. If I go up, it rotates the other direction quite quickly. Yeah, but if I go back to the to the four panel view, uh, um, it's it's a bit easier to see this. Let let me make this view a bit nicer. Um, let me just select here with the maps. Let me just select the white meta surface. It looks a bit nicer here on the bottom. Um, this, and now I do the same thing again. I press shift, I take the mouse, and you see on the bottom nicely where the, where the oblique section is that we are currently looking at. Yeah. Then zoom out. You see here all, all already the, the side maps that we have mapped in the big brain. They are not yet complete, as you see. and uh, you can see here how I can choose arbitrary, arbitrary angles and, 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 and zoom into high resolution for the big frame model. And this is, uh, and of course, there's a certain limitation. Yeah, it's, it's only 20 micron. It's not, you cannot go to one micron in the 3D model. But here you see we are here in the, uh, I think we're here in the motor system. I'm not a neuroanatomist, I must say. Uh, so we see here some really 
large cell bodies, which, which are probably modern neurons. Uh, we, can, we can see individual cell bodies. All right, uh, looking at my, uh, at my clock, I would like to come to the next part, but I have, um, uh, we can have a few minutes for questions now on, on, on this interactive, uh, interactive exploration here. So if you have any questions, uh, just let me know. Otherwise, I'm, I'm moving on to the, to the next part. Um, did I miss something important here? There is, of course, more to say, uh, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going in, into all the details now. Okay, so maybe one thing that I, that I should quickly mention is uh, any select areas. So of course, I can also select areas in the big brain model. You know, if, uh, I go, can also uh, just do the same thing with what I've done previously. Yeah, area one again. And of course, when I select it here, I, I get the same side panel. I get a region of features again. And I also see here the receptor density is linked. Um, and one thing uh, is this. This is also not yet working release candidate. What you could do while, while, you, while you search for these data sets in, in, the, in the online version, and when, once we release this new version next week, it will also be available. You can actually uh, pin data sets as, 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 as you find them here. And then you find these pin data sets here in the list. It's like kind of like a shopping cart to explore your data sets, and then you can download them all in, in a run. One other thing that I didn't go through is that, that you have actually a region browser here. So you see here the full region hierarchy uh, of the brain. And instead of clicking brain regions, like let me close that again. Uh, this, is, this is how you see everything at the start. So if you click this little icon here, you have the region hierarchy again. Oh, you can, of course, just search uh, for certain terms. You can, you can search for V1, for example, and you see here how it is embedded in the region tree. And you can also select the area from here, you know, by clicking and, 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 and so navigating there and selecting the brain region also from here. So there are more features. Of course, we cannot do everything here in the, in the time. All right. Um, that was the interactive part. Um, Let's now see how you can program with the atlases. And uh, you, can, you can do the very same things that I've just shown to you and more uh, in, in pure programming. And I will show you an, an interface in Python now uh, to where we would do, we'll do a, a few similar things. Um, and um, we, are, we are going to post a link now. We were just posted a link to a GitHub page in the chat. Uh, if you select this link, you will come here to a, um, to a GitHub repository that I put up for you just yesterday. We will extend this a bit more, where you find some Python notebooks uh, um, that show you different uh, ways, a few examples of how to work with the programmatic interface to the Atlas. And um, I'm going uh, to show you a few examples now from this first notebook here, basic concepts. Uh, you could, uh, from the GitHub page, just click the link here, launch binder, and it will actually open the notebook live for you and you can run it and execute it on your computer in the browser. Um, you need not do this. You can also just follow what I'm, what I'm saying. And you could also just uh, select the notebook here uh, to, to view it. But if you, if you choose the link that Hiba has also put, put into the chat, um, this link here, you can execute it. Yeah, and uh, I'm running this here. It, it may take a little moment. I will run this here from my local machine, the same thing, uh, but it should work for you. Maybe, maybe I give you a few, uh, few seconds uh, and it, it, might, it might take a, a, a minute to, to, to load it up. Uh, it, oh, the one here, sorry, I, my system is not running here. Give me a second. So back here. So this is the first notebook. If you're not familiar with Python notebooks, uh, we have here cells. The cells, if they're gray, they contain Python code. Uh, and sometimes they just contain text. Yeah. So it's a mix of text descriptions and Python code. Uh, and you can actually just 
hit play or run here on, on top, you could also press shift and enter and it will execute the cell. Yeah? The first cell is just text. So when I play it, it will just display the text. The next cell here, import zebra. Zebra is the Python library that contains all this functionality. So if I run the next cell, it will actually uh, uh, load zebra. It doesn't show any output since I had already loaded it. I do that again. Uh, so you see now it is loading a, a, a development version of this Python client. And here I have to give you a reminder. This is uh, still, we are still, uh, this is a rather new uh, software. This is still a development release. So the version one is to is expected towards the end of the year. We are still here in the development release, which might contain bugs and so on, but it has quite many features already and it is quite useful already. So you can hit play or shift enter to execute cells and we will go through a few things. First of all, this library Zebra gives us just access uh, to these different concepts. For example, zebra.spaces shows me the different template spaces that we support. You see here the big brain, the free surfer average, the MNI spaces, the wax home space, the Ellen space. Currently you just see names, but behind this are really objects in programming. You see here supported parcellations. Uh, this, the, there will be more support there. You see cortical layers in the big brain, uh, fight, uh, fiber bundles. Uh, you see the site architecture maps, the Waxhorn Atlas in different versions. It's all there. And these are really objects. Yeah. Um, so what I can do here in the next cell, I can, for example, select the big brain space uh, like this. And it will, let, let me just do this in a, in a new cell for you again. The good thing is while typing, I can, I can press tap and it knows this feature. So it is autocomplete. Yeah? I don't have to figure out the names myself. I can autocomplete them. And there's also a, a way of accessing them just by guessing uh, the name. So if, if you just provide text in square brackets, it will, Zebra will do its best to find that object. Yeah? So I can, I can also select this space, the big brain, by just typing big brain here. And uh, um, if I if I uh, type only big, it that might still be okay. But if I type big brother or something, there will of course be an error because it doesn't find a, a space with that name. Yeah. Um, and um, if I print this, you see that the type the type is really an object. This is a space object that has uh, quite some information like executing next uh, cell, you see that it has a name. And uh, um, actually, as you know, many of these uh, objects are uh, data sets in the knowledge graph. For example, if we select the, in a very similar fashion, the Jülich brain atlas here by choosing it from the parcellations, uh, it has an ID, it has a name and it has a description coming from the knowledge graph, just in the same way that you have seen it in the viewer. Yeah, you know, I, I see here the description, all this information is available here. Uh, and, and really right at your hands. Um, these parcellations also, uh, of course, give, uh, give access to brain regions and brain regions are also objects here in the Python code. So if I run the next cell, uh, you see that I can ask the parcellation that I have requested here on top, which is the, the Jülich brain uh, parcellation. I can ask it to give me the region object V1 and if I use the function decode region, it will really try to uniquely identify it. So it will complain if I if I put here a, a name of uh, that that uh, that that resolves to four different regions. I can also use find region uh, instead, and then it will give me a list of all matches. If I say decode, I'm telling Zebra I really want to have that one. And if if it's not sufficient my specification, then please complain. Yeah. So. Uh, it has found a region here, it's area A to C1. And you can see that this region is an object. It has, for example, a member parent. And if I ask for the parent, you see that the parent of area A to C1 is the occipital cortex, which is itself a brain region. Yeah? And I can actually, uh, if, I, if I look at this parent, you see the occipital cortex is a region which has actually a, a subtree. So it contains all its sub areas. HSC1, HSC2 in this space. So this is a data object uh, with, with rich information and with links to the knowledge graph, what you have here. Now these, um, I have to check a bit the time again. Um, these are just semantic objects. So what we have seen so far are parcellations, space, uh, uh, spaces, regions, just 
semantic objects. There's no real data included. It's just metadata. These are just concepts. Um, in the Atlas, we want to work with, uh, with data, like images of the maps of these parcellations. And this is a different concept. You see this in the next parts here. So I can, my parcellation object was the Jülich Brain Atlas. You remember here a few cells above, I have requested it. Um, now I can actually ask this Atlas to give me the map. And since we provide maps in different spaces, I have to, I have to specify the space. Yeah? So I want to get the map in the MNI152 space. This gives me an object, another object, which is of a different type. Uh, it's a label parcellation map. Um, and you see here that this map actually defines two different maps since the Ulich Brain Atlas is shipped separately for the left and right hemisphere. So this map actually has two images. Uh, and up until this point, I have not yet loaded any, any image data. This map is a spatial object, yeah? And it, uh, it, uh, it gives me links to the actual images, but I have not yet uh, loaded any images because in Zebra, uh, we perform a scheme of lazy loading of data. We only load data when we really need it. So when I want to look at these images, I can actually fetch them. And so I can ask the, the, the map object to fetch the data. And as you have seen here, we have two maps, the left and right hemisphere. Fetching them gives me a list of two, so I can go over the two of them and then use for example, now I learn to plot them. All images returned by, by Zebra are standard objects that, that can be understood by the common libraries like Nylearn and so on. They are just uh, Nyrabble objects. So I can just run this cell now. It will now fetch the data and show me the left and right hemisphere map as you can see here. Um, of course, I can do this for other maps. So maybe you wanna give it a try yourself uh, to, to actually show uh, the map of fiber bundles. Yeah based on this, um, if I'm checking the time, maybe you can think for, for a, a short minute whether you would figure out how to do that. And then I just write it out. Um, yeah, we still have a bit of time. So let's just give you a minute to think about it. There are, there are actually different ways of doing it. Any idea, any question? And in the interest of time, I'm doing that now. So if I want the map of fiber bundles, you might remember that we have long and short bundles. Here. When I go up, uh, you may have seen this here in the list of parcellations. You have seen that there are long white matter, superficial white matter bundles and so on. Um, so what I can do here is now, I'm writing the full thing, zebra.parcellations. And I would like to have long bundles. I just put, put this uh, as a string here. I think these two words long bundles should be sufficient, uh, uh, um, but I could also use the autocomplete and uh, yeah, and select them this way. Long white matter bundles. Yeah. Um, and then I say, get give me a map in the MNI 152 space. Also here, I could I could be very explicit, and I could say zebra dot spaces, and I have autocomplete as well. So then it gets a long line. Yeah, I I can I can make this much much shorter by saying here long bundles, and just here as well. It it understands it if I just give it a string, and I have fifty two. Then I have the map, and then I still need to fetch it. This is the full line, yeah? I specify the parcellation, I get the map in this space, and then I fetch the image data. This should work. Let's hope for the best. Yes, and now we see the maps of the, of the fiber bundles. I'm hoping that this works for you as well. And this can be done for any other things, of course, uh, just as well. Um, now we have seen that for all these aspects, we also have probabilistic maps. These are, these are of course, the simplified so-called maximum probability maps that show me the, the labeled regions. Uh, I can also explicitly instruct Zebra. Uh, here's a full line. I take the Jülich parcellation again, and I, select, I re request the map in the MNI152 space. But now I add an option and say, I'm interested in the continuous maps, not the labeled maps, the continuous maps, which for the Jülich plane are the probabilistic maps. And if I do that, you see it's very quick, uh, but 
it says this map has 302 different maps. Why? Because each probabilistic map is a, is a, is a, is a full volume, yeah? since it, it describes the probability distribution in a space. So for each region, I have here a different map. These are 302 different images, so it is huge. And as I said, we have a la lazy loading scheme, so it hasn't loaded any of these maps yet. That's why it was fast. If I would load them all, that takes quite a bit. Uh, so what I can do now is, if I want to look uh, at the at the one uh, for let's say for area one, I can actually this 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 map object. I can actually ask it to tell me which index it is. So I can say uh, decode region uh, we one left, and and it gives me an index of the of this region. And I can use this index now in the fetch command to fetch only this one region. So in order not to fetch all the three hundred. Doing that now, and here you see the, the probabilistic map of area v1, just in, in two lines of code. And uh, of course, that, that's that's easily reproducible then. Um, what I can also do is if, if I if I had just shown the, uh, the 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 if I would have just done in a different way and just say let I'm just interested in the number 120 here, uh, whatever that is, it shows me number 120. And then I can also ask the, the map to tell me what is the number, what is the 120? Yeah, please decode this. Uh, and it tells me this is area uh, MFG on the left side. So the these objects make it very safe to work with label indices, region names. Yeah, it's 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 very unlikely that when you use this library that you mess something up. All right. Um, I think I have to speed up a little bit here. Um, let's go a bit further below. Um, of course, I cannot only request maps, but I can also request the templates uh, from the, for the spaces. So I can, in a very similar fashion than requesting a map from a parcellation object, I can request a template from a space object. For example, I can request here the MNI-152 template and it, and it loads here the, uh, the G1 image from, from the space right from the, from the MNI website actually. This might take a bit longer on your side because Zebra caches everything, and I have executed this notebook before uh, uh, this session, so it, it was very fast on my side. It might take a bit on your side to, to download this thing here. Maybe you, you don't want to execute this. Now, where it's becoming interesting is for the big brain. I can do the same thing for the big brain. Uh, actually, I can just run the very same command, just, just selecting big brain, and it works. But what it is doing, uh, it's of course not loading the big print at the full resolution. <laughs> this would take very long. So I, uh, I have now downloaded the big print at a much lower resolution. Uh, downloading it at, at the full resolution would actually mean to download one terabyte, and we are not going to do that now. Um, but what you could do for big print is you can specify a volume of interest to get a full resolution, and that's quite easy. You can just use two points here in the physical space. And these points, you can get them from the viewer. You know, you, I, just a few minutes ago, I've shown you in the viewer where you can see the coordinates, yeah, in the, uh, the, the 3D coordinates, and you can just copy them. Uh, you can even copy them as a, as a string. Here I have them as real numbers, but it works just as well as a string. So I take one coordinate and the other, and then I can say, ask the space to give me the volume of interest between these two points. So the box between these two points, and I can use this volume of interest then in the fetch command. Uh, and I can then say, give me the full resolution, minus one uh, instructs it to take the full resolution, but only for this volume of interest, not for the whole thing. This works. I'm running this now. You see that I didn't execute this cell <laughs> before the session. So, uh, so this is now taking a bit, but I will wait a second. I can already say that we don't get through with all the tutorials here in, uh, in the 20 minutes. I was a bit optimistic how fast we can go, but I will speed up, uh, I will simply speed up. So now it's viewing them. I'm not sure if all of that works in your online session, but now you see here the chunk at the full resolution and I can using using the, the wonderful uh, commands from the nylon library, I can then here really see it. And the nice thing is I can now reuse this volume of interest uh, uh, also for the, for the parcellations to fetch 
uh, to fetch the cortical layer map, for example. You remember that there are, we have cortical layer maps in the big brain, so I can get the parcellation of the layers and then use the volume again, the volume of interest again, to also fetch these maps. And I can show them then on top of the big brain. Again, it takes a bit. While we are waiting for this, uh, the, the last concept, which you have probably been missing, besides spaces, parcellations, and regions, uh, of course, are atlases. So Zebra also provides uh, atlases as, as objects. And the atlases are really like a container around, uh, around parcellations, spaces, and regions. So if you select the human atlas, it will give you much easier access to the same things that you've seen above. And it gives you, of course, then access to the parcellations and spaces that are specific to the human atlas. And it gives you only the combinations that make sense. So in practice, you would typically start from an atlas here and then, and then use the commands of the atlas object to do the same things that we have done on the top in, in, in short form. The data loading was from here on my side now. So you see here now the same view of the big frame together with the map of the cortical layers at the full resolution. Yeah. And this is really just a, a spatial image object in Python, which even contains the FI matrix uh, that, uh, that put, positions it into, into the whole brain with brain space. All right. These were some basic concepts. And I have only a few minutes left until uh, we get to Maya's part. So I, I, I'm speeding up a bit. If you go back to this GitHub page with the tutorials, um, um, I will show you the second one. So you, if you launch the second one, retrieving multimodal data features, um, and I will do that here as well. Uh, I show you very quickly how you can access these regional data features that we have seen in the viewer. Uh, it works the very same way. So I just execute here, I'm loading Zebra on the top. And the point is for requesting data features, uh, we need access to the eBrains knowledge graph. And this requires you to have an eBrains account and uh, to follow a few steps uh, to get an, 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 a token uh, that allows Zebra to request data in your name. We are not going through these steps here and now. I have generated a token. I have pre-generated a token that you can just use uh, temporarily during this session. If you would want to do this yourself, you would need to get an eBrains account to be able and, and follow the steps written here to be able to do this uh, on your own. The token you have here will, will expire very soon uh, today. Um, so I think that uh, Hiba can, can paste the token into the chat so you can use that. If, if you run this next cell, it will ask you for the token. Um, and I, I have to do the same actually. So once Hiba pastes it, it's there. That's a long thing. Um, you can just uh, copy, so I, I do the same thing. I copy it here. I put it here in the link. Oh no, that was not correct. Copy. I copy it in, press enter. And now Zebra is informed about this authentication token and it can request data uh, in the name of the user who generated this token, which was a fake user for the, for, for the test user for this. So now maybe I give you a second. Uh, to do this. But then we have to move on in the interest of time. Uh, so now, if you look at the next lines, what I'm doing here is I'm selecting the human atlas with the Yulich parcellation. Actually, I can skip over this because that is the default anyway. Um, and I clear the selection so that the atlas has no region selected. This is also the default, of course. And then I can say get features and I ask for Zebra has a set of predefined feature modalities, data modalities, and I say receptor distribution. And if I execute this, you see that it, uh, it tells me that there are these areas uh, for, for which receptor density data is available. Um, it has actually fetched them already, uh, but what you, what you usually like to do is you're interested in a certain region. And that's the next cell. So I can, I can instruct the Atlas to select region V1. 
it's under the hood doing what we did in the previous uh, uh, notebook. And then I say again, get features, and it, it takes into account this selection, and I get only the features for V1. And these features are rich objects. So it, for example, these receptor features, they can plot themselves. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm plotting them. And you see here, I see these, these profiles, these cortical profiles of the different neurotransmitters, and I also see the receptor fingerprint, and it should be the exact same one that we have seen in the viewer for ARV1 uh, earlier. Um, there are other data modalities. I'm going a bit faster now. The next one is of particular interest. This is a preview. This is very new. Uh, no, I, for example, I see that Jan Fusek is here uh, with whom I'm working a lot. He hasn't seen that uh, yet. So this is very new. It's not even fully released. Uh, we have now also access to uh, cortical densities of, of cell distributions extracted from full resolution uh, histology data. And these are uh, um, carefully annotated by cortical layers. So they're also for, for the, here for region V1. We, I find here actually uh, um, 10 or 11 different data sets. I'm only, to, I'm only showing two here. Uh, different samples, you see here the locations in the big brain where they have been extracted uh, of cells extracted from the original histology data in this area and grouped by cortical layers. Uh, these, these data sets also contain sizes of the cells uh, and, and a lot of information, thickness of the cortical layers annotated here, quite rich data set. And this data set contains uh, um, uh, data for 12 different areas at the moment, and for each of them, more, 10 or more uh, such samples, and we will have that growing. But this is a pre-release, so uh, it shouldn't be used yet. We will release it officially through events very soon. This is just uh, here in the in this development preview. You can already get a glimpse of what you can do, and the same the same way Zebra uh, can extract gene expressions from the Ellen Atlas. It all goes the same way. I select the region. I say get features, but I just choose a different modality: gene expressions. So I get gene expressions from the Ellen Atlas here, and of course I can also get access to connectivity matrices in this very same way. It's, it's always the same two lines of code plus, plus a bit of code for displaying it. And I can also get access to these uh, EEG recordings and more things. Yeah, so it works just, just the same way. Um, I have eaten up my time. Uh, I wanted to show you more examples. I just give you a, now we're really just, a, a, we're not running it. I'm just showing that it's there. Um, they are in the same uh, in the same tutorial tutorials. There is a notebook that shows you how, we, given given two points, uh, you could use the atlas to actually do a probabilistic assignment to brain regions here. So to find the most probable brain regions uh, that this point is located in, and then use this, for example, to find fiber bundles that are likely to connect these brain regions, and then. Uh, uh, extract these uh, connectivity profiles and to see if, if we have streamlines from VTI that explain the same that explain the same connection. So you can do a lot of things and there are examples here uh, to go deeper. I'm not, I'm not doing that now since we have to finish. And the last notebook is of particular interest, the number four here. Um, I was hoping to run this this morning. It was too slow. I just show it quickly. Um, this shows how you can actually analyze some data. So what this uh, is doing, it loads a toolbox, Zebra Toolbox, uh, in addition, which performs uh, an analysis of differential gene expressions in the brain. And the way that works is, again, you, you fetch an atlas and you select regions in the atlas. And then Toolbox can use this atlas configuration to run a, a differential gene expression analysis. Uh, so it will really use this to extract for these brain regions gene expressions for some candidate genes. Um, of course, uh, it can show you where these, uh, where these, um, where these uh, have been found from the Ellen Atlas. And then it can run such an analysis and give you the p-values uh, of, of, uh, of the expression in, the, in, this, in these different brain regions. We are skipping over this. You, you find the notebooks here and um, the, in, the, in this GitHub. And we will, we will continue to work on providing more examples and more documentation uh, here with these tutorials. So stay tuned if, 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 if this is interesting for you. And also, if you have more questions, uh, get in touch with us, uh, with me or Hiba, and you can also contact support at ebrains.eu if you have questions, and we will do our best 
uh, to help you getting started. Just before I give the stage to Maya, um, again, I would like to, uh, to emphasize that this Python client uh, that I've shown here, it's, you, you have seen that you can do a lot of with it already, but it's still a development preview. So we are constantly changing things, fixing things, improving things, adding features. There's a lot happening, but which also means if you use it, there might be things that don't work right yet, or there might be things that don't work. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Towards the end of the year, there will be a stable release, which is fully tested, uh, and uh, but a lot of the functionality here is already working well and is also already tested. I just wanted to emphasize again that this is a development preview, but it's fully accessible. The code is uh, fully online. It's all openly accessible. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I passed the, the stage to, to Maya, who shows you a very interesting workflow now for extracting image features in Rodent Atlas space. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Maya Pichales. I'm from the neural system uh, lab at the Oslo University. So today I will uh, present to you the Quint workflow, which is uh, a workflow allowing us to um, do quantification of cell numbers of objects or interests uh, in serial histological image data. And uh, I will start this presentation a little bit from the other end by giving you an overview of the results you can obtain uh, with the, the quid workflow. Uh, so here, uh, I, I'm, I'm giving you the end results. And so what we have here is um, we have um, done a study uh, using uh, Calbindin and um, our albumin. Uh, series. So we had six whole brain uh, histochemistry carbon series of uh, mice. And then also we have had four carbon series of uh, another type of mice that was labeled with a yellow fluorescent protein. And uh, in addition, we also had four whole brain series of formerly stained uh, uh, sections in the adult Sprague Dolly female rats. And uh, as you can see from this uh, illustration on the left, uh, we anchor the, all the sections to the atlas and get atlas maps. Then we segment all the cells, soma, uh, here with a elastic. And then we can obtain quantification data about uh, where the, those cell somas are located in the different brain regions. Uh, you can find all the, the data collection on the eBrains portal, at, uh, like uh, Timo showed you before, and all, all the tools are also available on the portal uh, following those links. So let's continue. Um, just wanted to, uh, before going into details of the workflow, show you that you can find the collections of the data here in the, in the knowledge graph search. Uh, typing search terms, you will get a list of data sets. Uh, when you select them, uh, you get access to a data set card with all the details, uh, citation, authors, uh, some uh, summary of what the data set, uh, which experiments were performed. And you also have access to viewers uh, in the film strip manner to examine all the sections one by one if you want to. And you also can download all those um, sections. The tools are available through the eBrains website. Uh, here, uh, when you go under the Atlas services, you will find direct access to uh, the Quint workflow and also some of the other tools that uh, Timo talked about. Um, if you press on the Quint, you will get to this uh, collaboratory page, uh, which has a lot of um, information. You will find direct links to um, 
download the software installation information, you will find detailed tutorials, demo videos, and also, of course, user support, uh, ticket system, and uh, also GitHub uh, links. So now, if we um, go through the, the Quint workflow, um, the Quint workflow um, has three main uh, steps. Uh, the first one being uh, brain section image registration to the reference atlas with the Quickney tool and the visual line tool. So here is an illustration of uh, the graphical user interface of Quickney. Uh, well, you see the, the section is, uh, is seen in transparency mode with the, the atlas on top. You perform an affine registration and then you can go uh, and refine it with a nonlinear refinement. And I will go to more details of this uh, later in the presentation. Um, then the second step is, uh, is the step where you segment out your object of interest with the Elastic software. Um, here we uh, segmented out the uh, cell somas for the palvanian cells and the cambidin cells. And then the third step, uh, you do uh, an atlas-based uh, regional analysis with a Util tool, which can give you detailed reports of exactly uh, how many cells of different types you had in, in the different uh, brain regions. And here you have all the brain regions. So it's a whole brain analysis. And uh, as you will see on the, on the mouse and rat uh, brain atlases, uh, the regions are color coded. So the green regions are uh, cortical regions, and then you will go to brain stem regions, and, and then you have all the other also regions. Um, the way when you, when you go through the whole um, uh, workflow at the end, you will get files, and I will return to that, uh, allowing you to do 3D object visualization like we did here. Uh, showing in the 3D viewer the distribution of all parvalbumin cells and uh, you, also the calbin cells, so you can compare them. Uh, we also did in this particular case <coughs> for process across species, as we had both mice and rat data. And as you can see here, uh, we, we have plotted uh, the number of parvalbumin neurons uh, in rat and mouse. So you, you can see that you have, we have many more uh, cells here in, in rat and mice, but you can, it differs from regions to regions. And then uh, uh, also you can um, have a look uh, specifically in, in, uh, in, in some regions if you like to. And all this is published uh, recently in the iScience paper. So now I will take you through the different steps of the workflow. The first one being uh, anchoring of the brain sections to the reference atlas with Wikney. Uh, as you can see on this uh, section that is here in A, uh, uh, there are some um, brain regions that will match to a certain planche, uh, 2D planche that you can find in the book atlas. But so all the region will match another planche. And this is because, as Trugbe mentioned earlier, uh, sometimes the, the sections are cut in oblique angles, and then it's, it's making it difficult to know exactly where you are. And using the Quickney tool, you will be able to tilt the 3D reference atlas, like in this case, uh, dorsoventral tilt of 10 degrees and a mediolateral tilt of 3 degrees. This will allow you to uh, get an exact match, uh, an exact map for your experimental section. So um, the purpose of using this tool is to determine those two angles and to apply them to your uh, sections. So here you have an overview of the Putney user interface. Um, you have a main window where you can see your experimental section. Uh, on the top, 
you will have you can select different reference templates you can look at the mri the dta or the delineations and uh, you have on the left side the transparency slider allowing you to toggle between your section and the atlas and also you have a view of the sagittal and the horizontal view of the atlas uh, and uh, as i said by determining uh, different angles in the sagittal mode and horizontal mode, uh, you will find a good match for your section. You can do that for a few sections and then the software will arrange all the, the sections with the same angles. So it's a manual process in the beginning, but afterwards it's, uh, it go, it's uh, giving you uh, suggestions and you have to validate those. Uh, this is how a uh, quick knee output could look like. Um, some regions are fitting very well, but you still have some gaps here, maybe especially in the, in the borders. Uh, remember that with quick knee, you do um, linear uh, anchoring, and, but then you can go a step further using the visual line tool uh, performing a nonlinear registration uh, within one plane. And here, this is done by placing um, markers at cert certain points and dragging, um, dragging the atlas uh, to the position you want. Because this workflow is quite long, I don't have um, time to show you in details everything, but I, you will, I will show you a small video that will give you an impression on, on how it's done. So um, here um, I'm going to the second step, which is uh, machine learning segmentation with Elastic tool. So the Elastic software allow you to segment uh, your object into classes of interest based on supervised random forest learning algorithm. And uh, you, so here we have defined two classes, the blue be, class being the, the, the cell somas and the yellow being the background. Uh, so the tool relies on input from you and annotations to train images. And usually um, if you have a, a data set of 80 to 100, uh, series sections, it will be sufficient to train a classifier using 10 to 15 uh, sections. And then uh, once uh, trained, the classifier can be applied to the rest of your series in a batch mode. Uh, and this is the, you see on the right side, the results you will get from the, this uh, classification is, uh, uh, binary image files showing you your segmented objects. With Elastic, you can use uh, different workflows. You have a pixel classification workflow, that is the one illustrated here, where you filter uh, and train the classifier based on intensity, color, and textures of your objects. Uh, but sometimes we also apply an object classification um, uh, classifier in top of that to get rid of artifacts because this object classification um, classifier is based on size and shape. So it adds a, a nice complement to this. And then the third step is uh, distribution analysis and quantification with a neutral quantifier software. Uh, this is how the interface look like. Um, so you start a new job uh, here by pressing new. Um, then uh, you give a name to your project and select uh, quint as the analysis type. Uh, you will have to select your directories. Uh, usually we have folders. So one folder where we place all the Atlas maps you obtain from Quickly and Visualign and another folder where you plus, place your elastic segmentation files. And then you have to select uh, which atlas you want to work with. So here we've chosen the 
Rapsom Atlas of the Rat version 3. Um, you select uh, the directory of your coordinate file, that is uh, an XML file containing the coordinate information. Uh, this is also obtained from QuickDNI and Visualine. And then you just have to have a folder, an empty folder where you want the software to place all the results. What is important is to select the exact color of your segmented objects. So the objects you had uh, obtained with the uh, elastic. Then you save all those parameters in the, in, the, in the file for the YouTube program. And then you can start the analysis by pressing start. And this is how the results would look like. Look like. You will get a set of three uh, new folders, one co containing the coordinates. So you will have a coordinate file for each of your sections and also one that is showing the combined uh, objects. Those can be plotted in a 3D viewer uh, and your segmented objects are color coded uh, according to brain regions and you can choose yourself how this will be. Um, you get in the image uh, map folder, you get all the all your sections, uh, specific maps. And here you will see the segmented object on top of them. Uh, here they have different colors just to, to be able to see in contrast with the, the colors of the, of the Atlas map. And finally, you have report reports in a CSV format. And here also you have one report per slice, all you have, or you can have a combined uh, report with all, all the objects that you've uh, cemented. Um, so now I would like to show you this small video uh, we recorded. Um, it will give you uh, an impression on how the tools perform. So again, it's a reminder of like the Quint workflow uses three open access softwares, Elastic, Quickness, and Mutil. So here, starting with Elastic, as you can see, you can zoom in, define your classes. And then you, um, you do a live update and uh, the software will predict position of your objects and you can refine a bit to make sure that uh, the objects are really segmented properly. So here we reduced a bit the size, then you obtain all your objects for each slice. So the next step is the registration to the Atlas. Uh, here we have a sagittal section and we need to find the position, the exact position. And uh, as I told you, you have to define uh, the exact angles. Cutting, so you see it's a little bit oblique. You can tilt the atlas, you can rotate. So it doesn't matter if your experimental section is not exactly um, well oriented that you can you can really adapt the atlas and then the last part is a neutral analysis where you input all the parameters run and then you get results so the quantifier uh, is quite uh, rapid it doesn't take so long time the longest part is to get the these cl point clouds files, uh, especially if you have many, many small uh, objects. Uh, this can take several minutes to get the, to get all the, the point clouds. And of course, we add uh, we add new things to the workflow, and 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 we'll post them on the on on the eBrains website. 
Um, I wanted to give you some more examples of use. So for example, here, what we did, uh, we had both sagittal mouse brain section labeled for bavandamin and coronal mouse sections. And we wanted to combine them. Um, and we did that uh, by running each of the, sorry, by running each of those uh, two series through the quint workflow. And as you can see here, by combining those two data sets, you will get uh, more, uh, First, you can compare those two data sets, but also you can enrich and have a broader coverage of the whole brain um, by combining a sagittal and a coronal section. Um, what I would like to say also is that the, the Quint workflow is compatible with connectivity data. So if you have labeled a uh, brain series of mice or rat with uh, co connectivity data, you can extract those is not restricted to, to just cell somas. And then you can get those point clouds representing here, for example, injection area. And, and then you can see the, the bundles and, and the terminal fields and using uh, also um, some 3D visualization programs to, to have a look at, at that. Um, so I invite you to join our user community. We have, uh, of course, the eBrain support uh, page where you can reach us and ask any question. And we have quite a few. Uh, we have uh, GitHub repositories, both for uh, uh, Quick Visualine, Elastic, and, and Mutil. And uh, we also have. Uh, course, the Neuroscience Data Integration course that we have here at the University of Oslo. Uh, and this year, this course will be in the beginning of September. And uh, it will be uh, a virtual course. So it's open for, um, for students also that are not located at uh, your Oslo University. Uh, again, all the tools and tutorials are available on the, on the eBrains portal. And, um, yeah, this is, uh, I would like to acknowledge my, all my colleagues uh, at the uh, EIO. We also collaborate with, uh, with Yulish and uh, the Elastic team at the MBL. Um, and um, thank you for your attention. And don't hesitate to contact us if you, if you have questions. <laughs>